we were talking about the verse and in Second Corinthians, mm -hmm. uh, the verse that we use to say, uh, use for benediction, the last verse of Second Corinthians. Uh -huh, 13, 14, yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, it, it mentioned about the Trinity, correct. And it mentioned right. uh, quite clearly the three roles, uh, the grace of Jesus Christ, love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, grace, love, and fellowship. Right. The distinct role. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, how to explain that. Uh, if that's an example of the role that the three Godhead plays. And uh, yeah, and then also in other areas, we talk about the fellowship uh, of Jesus Christ, uh, of the of spirit being a paraclete or someone come alongside you. Well, it's something mm -hmm. like fellowship, right? Coming alongside you and so on. Mm -hmm. Parachurch, yeah, parachurch, yeah. So I thought, yeah, maybe that makes sense. And uh, why would you say that as a heresy in that sense? The role. Okay, if, if, you, if you say that there are, there is only one person playing three roles, that will be heretical. But here we are talking about three distinct oh, okay. persons. Yeah, that's the difference. Okay. Yeah, but the like, three what, what, distinct like, persons are still one God. Yes. That's the mystery. Okay. Oh, okay. It's a bit complicated. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's like one person can play different role. He can be a father. He can be a, a son. And it, it can be a teacher. Oh, it's the same thing. Right. But that's know. not it. That is not it. That's not it. Yes. Okay. But that is not it. Yeah. yeah. It's three different separate unique identities okay so you yeah. think that and so there's a fine fine line there it's a fine line and indeed yeah, yeah. okay and the okay. next one you will follow is uh so so what if they believe that way the, the basic foundation they still believe in in the submission then well no you see it. um you <clears throat> you need to realize that the holy spirit is god yeah Jesus, the Son, is God, yeah. and the Father is God. Yeah. And if, if you say that they three are playing different roles and they're all the one person, then you're actually saying that the Father died on the cross, which cannot be. Okay. The Father didn't die on the cross. It was the, the second person in the Trinity okay, okay. on the cross. Yeah, so we cannot crucify the Father. Okay, um, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that, that's why it's very important to know that all three are completely and fully God. Because for Jesus to be the savior and the redeemer of the world, if he was only an adopted son, he could not have uh, secured our salvation. Okay. If they say yeah. the adopted son, then there's, there's a heresy, correct? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, anybody yeah. else? Uh, yes, um, regarding, I think this is a follow-up question from um, the first lesson, um, mm -hmm. talking about the relevance of uh, creed in um, modern Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, I, Like I said, I don't see um, believers reciting the creed, nor um, being even aware of the creed. Um, okay. So the question is, uh, although we see, I mean, I've been to so many websites of different churches mm -hmm. um, and they have this thing called the statement of faith. Mm. Um, so my question is, is, um, I mean, we all hold different views of, you know, whether the creed is relevant in modern Christianity. Um, the question is that if it's not used, um, in a very practical sense, mm. um, is it hidden in the statement of faith um, by different churches? Um, that's number one. And number two is that because we we see in the the books of in the book of Acts um, where there's a Jerusalem Council, you know, and in our modern setting, uh, there are different denominations, divisions of uh, uh, different leadership, do we have some sense of a unifying um, council, whether it is um, informal, formal, to unify and to discuss um, a false teaching and, uh, you know, coming with a statement as a new unifying 
Catholic Church, you know, in that sense. Okay, all right. Um, you, the comment you made earlier on was that we don't recite the creed. Uh, that would not be true uh, in the mainline churches. All the mainline churches would recite the creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed will be done during the uh, baptism, and the Nicene Creed will be done during communion services. In the Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian churches. In the independent churches like uh, Bartley Church, my church, the Brethren Church, we do not have the creeds, nor do we recite the creeds, but as you rightly said, we have a statement of faith. And each independent church would come up with their own statement of faith. And now if you examine your own statement of faith in Bartley, and if I were to examine mine in Yochukang Chapel, I would conclude and you would conclude that the same structure that you find in the Apostles' Creed is also found in our statement of faith. In SPC, where I teach, every prospective student who comes in and even a lecturer, they will have to consent to the statement that uh, Singapore Bible College holds to. And that statement of faith is also about God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the church, uh, the judgment, the, the, the return of Christ, that kind of thing. Very, very broad strokes you would have in every statement. Now, in my church, we don't recite the statement of faith un until, uh, well, maybe not until. Once a year, we will recite it um during agm after the agm is over the chairman of the board will lead us and uh, he will read the whole thing and then we will just affirm by saying i or amen or something like that so we do that once a year however there may be churches who may never ever do it but they do have a statement so in the light of a heresy that occurs in an independent local church, the local leadership will have to match this against the statement of faith that they profess. In an Anglican church, they have the diocese. So it's not one church, but it's a whole geographic area that comes under the rule of a bishop. So if there is heretical teachings, that will be uh, presided by a bishop. And the bishop will determine uh, based on what they believe and in scriptures, whether this is a heresy or not. If it's a heresy, they will denounce it and they will uh, perhaps take to the person to task. If he uh, refuses to recant, then they might excommunicate him or discipline him in some ways. I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, it will be dealt with locally but because we have so many different denominations we are not under one umbrella however in the first 500 years while there were in existence individual churches they all came under the umbrella of one holy catholic apostolic church hence if there was an issue in one local assembly or a church then the bishop of that area will preside over this and uh, deal with the issue. Does that help? Um, yes, I, I understand uh, what you uh, spoke about. Um, it's just that uh, what, what is your um, command and um, understanding of the current um, oh, I love 21st it. century um, situation in oh, light of, is, yeah. Okay. Okay, now recently when we had the LGBTQ, so, sorry, I'm, I I can't see you all because suddenly I touched something and I am like, um, I've lost you guys. Uh, so I, I, I'm i still here, okay? In, in uh, the LGBT uh, situation in Singapore, we've had um, the bishops speak in the Anglican church We've had the, um, uh, let me see, the 
council of churches that represent all the denominations. We've had different people right through the established organizations that we have. We have um, the WCC is the World Council of Churches, but we have the NCC, National Council of Churches in Singapore. So most of the churches, I think under NCC, there could be more than 200 churches that come under the umbrella. Then you've got the Bible Presbyterians who have their own um, synod that uh, is represented. So whenever there is an issue that is really uh, doctrinally unsound, then uh, the church will need uh, a spokesman who would come up and write a document uh, to show where the evangelical Christians stand. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, let's go now. <clears throat> and keep your questions for later if uh, we need to talk again. Okay. Now, uh, are we okay with monarchian, monarchianism, both the dynamic or the adoptionist and the modalistic? If so, I will now move on to the second heresy. This was more deadly than the first. It's called Arianism, and it's named after this man who was an elder of the church in Alexandria. His name was Arius. I hope all of you got your slides. Of the others who are not from Bartley, you all have your slides. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you did not get yours um, because it was not shared with you. I'm really, really sorry about that. Okay. Um, all of them should have received already. Sorry? All of them should have received already. I've done it. Already, yeah? Yes. Okay, great. I hope all of you got it. So if you haven't got it, please uh, let Evangeline know and then she will uh, give it to you. Okay. Arius was an elder in a church. So he was actually a leader and therefore had access to the word of God, access to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I mean, at that time, it was still in loose form, access to the teachings of the apostles. And again, remember, I mentioned the most of the heresies came about because the leaders were so concerned in keeping God as one, not two or three. They wanted God to be monotheistic, not polytheistic, one God and not many gods. So Arius came at a time where the Monarchians were really um, causing the church to um, have this dilemma about the three persons in the Godhead. So he came up with a solution, which he thought was a great solution. In a way, he was a little bit like the adoptionist monarchians. He taught that Jesus is not is a creature and he is not of the same essence as God the Father. So uh, just take a minute to think about this, okay? Jesus is God, but he is not of the same nature as God. In other words, he is subordinate, different, another kind of God. Only God the Father is truly God. Jesus is the firstborn to be created. And God used Jesus to create the universe. So in that way, Jesus is special. But if you put Jesus next to God the Father, he is different from God the Father in terms of his nature, in terms of his essence. In other words, God the Father and Jesus the Son come from two different entities, 
altogether. That is heresy. That is heretical teaching. So that was uh, Arius. He said Jesus was God's special creation, firstborn of all creation. But this is the this is the clinching thing that makes him a heretic. He was not always there. There was a time when he was not. The understanding in the statement is that there was a time where Jesus did not exist. What does that say about his understanding of Jesus? There was a time when Jesus was not in existence. We read John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning means there is no time frame. There was no time when Jesus, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word Jesus. There was no time when the second person in the Trinity did not exist. We do not believe that there was a time where Jesus did not exist. Yes, we do believe that there was a time where he was not called Jesus. But he always existed as the second person in the Holy Trinity. How do we know this? You know, in the Old Testament, I don't know if you remember some of the stories, uh, we use the term theophany. A theophany is an appearance, an appearance of deity in the flesh. And there were times, for example, when Abraham met three strangers one of whom was not an angel, but the angel of the Lord with a capital A and a capital L. The angel of the Lord is the second person in the Holy Trinity who appeared in human flesh, human form. So even in the Old Testament, we have reference that there was no time where the second person never existed. There always was a second person in the Trinity or in the Godhead. So that's the, the, the critical thing I want you to take note of, okay? Can you see the slide? Ken? Can you see the slide? The next yes. one? Ken, huh? okay. I just wanted to be sure because sometimes when I get uh, in a trouble, then this, this doesn't move. Okay, now how did Arius teach his followers about Jesus, the second person in the Holy Trinity? He wrote poetic language or he wrote songs in rhymes, put it to music <clears throat> and let people sing it. Because remember, at this time, we're talking about the fourth century, a lot of people still couldn't read or write. The only way they re they knew under they knew facts or they knew information was to memorize. What better way to memorize than to learn it in a song? He was a smart guy. He taught them to memorize this teaching, which was heresy. He didn't think it was heresy. We know it is heresy. But I want you to see how important music was even in the early days where people could sing. I, I'm sure a lot of you, like just now somebody was mentioning the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, a hymn. And you know, a lot of times we get our theology from hymns. What if the theology is not sound? If the theology is not sound, or correct, then our understanding of Christian truth can be erroneous. 
or errors or wrong. So remember that. So from this song, I want to um, add a warning that there are songs today that we may be singing, even in our churches, that may not be theologically correct. Maybe not so theologically correct, but this one is theologically erroneous. Let's look at it. The uncreated God has made the sun. Now look at the word made. When you think of the word made, you think in terms of uh, creating, bringing it to pass, making it happen, a beginning of things created. <clears throat> and by adoption has God made the sun. So again, here the word adoption is being used into an advancement of himself. Yet the son's substance is removed from the substance of the father. Now notice this is where the danger is. Yet the son's substance, that means what makes up the son, is removed from the substance of the father, meaning it is not the same. The son is not equal to the father, nor does he share the same substance. This is the, the main part of the song that Arius wrote to teach his followers what he thought was correct doctrine. But actually what he was teaching was erroneous doctrine, wrong teaching. False teaching. All right. So <clears throat> the question then that would eventually tear the, the, the universal church apart was these two possibilities. The question the church leaders now were now debating over was one. Is Jesus, okay, I'm using a Greek term here, homo usios with the Father, or is Jesus Christ homoi? Look at the one I, I underlined the words, the letters. One is homo, one is homoi. What's the difference? Now, this is not Arius' teaching, okay? This is how the church finally were divided into understanding what they thought was the truth, and they were fighting Arius. Arius already made it very clear that Jesus and, uh, Jesus and God the Father do not have the same essence, okay? That's already established. Now, the rest of the church throughout your, uh, east and the west of the Roman Empire are choosing one of two options. The first one is, does Jesus have the same essence? That's what homo means. You know, you have homo sapien, same human beings, huh? homo sapien, homosexual, same sex. The same word this is homo. But the second word is usios. Usios means nature or substance or essence. What makes God God? So one group was saying, what makes God God and what makes Jesus God is the same. Same thing, same essence, same nature. But there was another group that was a larger group that used the Greek word homoi, and it is like. Now, sometimes we use this word interchangeably, but I want you to notice that these scholars were fighting over a diphthong, just one letter in the Greek alphabet. Is it homo? Or is it homoi? And then, of course, Arius and his followers uh, believed in different essence, 
different nature, different substance. And so um, what happened was this debate that was going on in the Roman Empire among the church leaders was so destructive that it was almost tearing the empire, the secular political empire apart. And so the man who would now want to interfere in this whole problem is a man we know as Constantine the Great. Okay, oh, I'm telling you, and okay, all right. Uh, okay, we'll come back to Constantine the Great, but I want to introduce you to another problem, not so um, different from Arius, but this concerns the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this man was a bishop of Constantinople and his name was Macedonius. He, again, was concerned in keeping God one. And so when he taught about the Holy Spirit, he said, the Holy Spirit is a creature created by the Son. Although he accepted the Son as, uh, as God, divine, he couldn't accept the Holy Spirit as God, deity. So he said, he came to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is really a creature created by the Son. And the Holy Spirit is subordinate to the Father and the Son, meaning that there is a, a hierarchy. Father is the highest, Son is the second highest, Holy Spirit is the third in line of um, power, authority, and status. Okay? The conclusion then was that the Holy Spirit has a different essence from God the Father. The Holy Spirit has a different essence from God the Father. He and his followers, called the Macedonians, were condemned at the Council of Constantinople in the year 381. Now, I, the reason why I wanted to give you uh, uh, this message about this man as well is because now I'm going to go into the councils to show you how the problem was going to be resolved by the universal church. Okay. So we have three problems I mentioned or three heresies, monarchianism where, where there, we found two kinds, Arianism, which said that Jesus was a creature and Macedonius who said that Jesus is uh, the Holy Spirit is a creature. Only God the Father is God. Holy Spirit and the second person, Jesus Christ, are not of the same essence as God the Father. <clears throat> so, the issues that the church leaders were fighting about was so severe that it almost tore the Roman Empire apart. You know, the Roman Empire was newly unified by a man called Constantine the Great. He was called the Great because he was great. <clears throat> he had become a Christian just before he entered the battle. And during the battle, he saw, it, said, it is said that he saw a sign of a cross in the sky. And it said, in this name, conquer. So it is said that he won the battle and he believed that it was Jesus, the one the sign pointed to, that gave him the victory. So when he became a Christian emperor and he unified the Roman Empire under his rule, and now so quickly the Roman Empire is fighting over a theological issue that could cause the rupture of the Roman Empire. So he's very concerned. So you know what? For the first time in history, a Christian emperor is interfering in a theological matter. And the theological matter is about Jesus 
whether he's God and Holy Spirit, whether he's God. All right. So he calls the meeting. He convenes the council. So we call this council the first of the ecumenical councils. And the word ecumenical in Greek means that which pervades the whole earth, ecumenical. So church leaders representing the churches throughout the Roman Empire, which is the world of the time, were represented at this council meeting in the year 325. This was the first council. And just now I mentioned the Council of Chalcedon, uh, the Constantinople, I beg your pardon, the Council of Constantinople in 381. Uh, I need to you to note that these two councils will eventually uh, fully establish through a creedal statement who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. Okay, so uh, let me move on, but look at the third point I made here. The, the emperor, who is a secular political leader, interferes for the first time in theological matters, in matters of the church. And this will be the beginning of many more times when the emperor will interfere in the affairs of the church. Okay? So just bear that in mind. All right, the Council of Nicaea, 325. Remember what I said earlier on about Arius? Arius did not believe that Jesus had a divine nature, completely different. Then there were two other groups in the council who were fighting over an iota, one letter in the Greek alphabet. Is it homo or is it homoi? Is it same nature? Is it like nature? Now, maybe when we use this word, uh, we, we may be using it interchangeably, but actually it's wrong, you know? Say, for example, I say that um, Pastor Ma looks like King Lian. Okay, I say Pastor Ma looks like King Lian. What do I mean? I'm actually, I'm not saying they are the same, am I? No, right? I am saying they may look similar in features, but they are two different people all together. But when you say that they are the same, you are saying they are one and the same. Sometimes he goes by King Lian. Sometimes he goes by Pastor Ma, all right? So that's same. The other earlier illustration is like. So it's such a delicate thin line as somebody mentioned earlier on. It is a thin line, but it is two different things. So what happens at this, count, uh, at this council? There was division, three parties. Three groups of people who said three different things. And then comes the champion of orthodoxy that was none other than Athanasius. This guy, Athanasius, okay? This is Athanasius, who when he first came as a very young man to this council in 325, he came as a representative to the Bishop of Alexandria. Soon after this council was over, the bishop died. And this man, Athanasius, was made the bishop. So really, he was a bishop of Alexandria for many years. But because his position of who Jesus is was contested 
by different groups of people at different times. And the different emperors took sides with Arianism or with Athanasius. Whenever the, the emperor who was ruling at the time took sides with Arius, then Athanasius was condemned and exiled. They chased him out of his position as bishop and he went into the wilderness uh, to be with the monks in the monasteries. So five times the champion of orthodoxy was exiled, but he fought orthodoxy tooth and nail. Now, when I use the word orthodoxy, I mean correct doctrine, right doctrine, okay? I don't mean orthodox church, huh? I mean orthodoxy as in correct doctrine, right doctrine. So Athanasius championed the cause of Jesus Christ being God, same essence as God the Father, same nature as God the Father. There was another group, the large group that said Jesus was like the father in essence, like only, not same. So what does the emperor do? There was a lot of contention and Athanasius fought tooth and nail for the correct doctrine for orthodoxy. Finally, a statement was made and it was called the Creed of Nicaea. Now in your notes, I didn't put out the Creed of Nicaea here because there was so, too much to, to write. Uh, I have given you in your notes. Can you take a look at your, your notes under the Creed of Nicaea, which is in point number six, the outcomes in Nicaea. Don't look at Constantinople yet. I will bring you into Constantinople under the Nicene Creed. But notice what the churches today recite as the Nicene Creed was not the 325 Creed, which we call the Creed of Nicaea. The creed that churches today uh, recite, I know that in our, our group here, there were some who came from the Methodist Church. What they recite as the Nicene Creed during uh, <clears throat> Holy Communion is the 381 Council uh, Creed that was polished purified and came out as the Nicene Creed, okay? Uh, later, if you are confused by this, you can ask me some uh, questions. But I, I want to now take you through the Creed of Nicaea. Read with me, huh? Okay, before that, um, yeah, I, I mentioned this already without showing you the slides. Athanasius fought passionately to preserve the deity of Jesus Christ. And he wrote a book called, at that time, did not call books, a manuscript on the incarnation of Christ or the incarnation of the word, the second person in the Holy Trinity. And uh, in 325, the emperor, realizing that the groups were so divided, moved towards Athanasius and allowed that to be accepted but Athanasius was not happy because the complete creed that he wanted to, uh, to be espoused was not, was not uh, accepted. And it took another council, 381, where the Nicene Creed actually is the creed that we know today as the Nicene Creed. Okay? All right, let's look at the Nicene Creed. Uh, the, oh, I did put some here, I think. Okay, the Creed of Nicaea. Now notice again, the three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The first one is, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. Second, which is the longest, lengthiest statement, because that was what they were fighting about. Whether the Son has the same nature as <clears throat> the Father. The Son of God, uh, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father. 
Okay, the word is not made, but begotten. Begotten means coming forth from. That's the word in Greek, ganea. Ganea means not created. It's coming out of, from the Father, okay? The Son of God begotten of the Father, that is, from the substance of the Father. Remember Arius' song, the substance was different. Here the creed says, the Son of God comes from the substance of the Father. Then, see the way it is crystallized. In case you didn't get it, the creed is saying, in case you didn't get it, let me underscore that the Son has the same essence as the Father. So the word used here is, he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one substance, homo usios, not homoi, homo usios, with the Father. By him, all things were made, things in heaven and on earth, for us men and for our salvation, he came down, was made flesh, and became man. He suffered, rose again on the third day, and ascended into the heavens. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. <clears throat> okay? Now, notice of all the three statements of the Trinity, the second person of the Holy Trinity is the lengthiest. It's that long. Father is one statement. Just, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, visible, things visible, invisible. Second one, light of light, God of God, true God, true God, begotten, not made, etc., etc. As you have time to read later on again, I want you to just focus on that to see how important it was. Why? Because Jesus, the second person, was the person that was under attack by most of the her her uh, heretical teachers. He was the one who was under attack because people didn't know how to place him. Because if you say he's fully God, then what do you do with God the Father? Then what do you do with the Holy Spirit? How do you count? It seems like three gods, but we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one. So how to be one when you say everybody is God? Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God. Very, very confusing. So notice how lengthy that is because there was a problem and the problem needed to be dealt with. Eileen was asking about problem. How is it solved today? At that point in the early church, this is how the whole church leadership came together, discussed, fought, debated, looked at the scriptures to see what the apostles taught. And they came out with a statement, which is not in the Bible, but the concepts are from the Bible. But they use qualifiers, true God from true God, light from light, begotten, not made. Then look at the, the third person in the Trinity. What does it say? I believe in the Holy Spirit, full stop. Because Macedonius, his problem arose between the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, between 325 and 381. That is why when we go into the Council of Constantinople, we now see the emergence of the Nicene Creed, which will give you proper, clear instructions as to who Jesus is and now who the Holy Spirit is. But before we go into that, I want you to notice a paragraph that I have here, which was in the Nicene Creed. And what is that paragraph? That paragraph is about anathemas. What is anathema? The word anathema means cursed, cursed, 
Cursed be anybody who dares to believe that Jesus is not God. Cursed be anybody who says that Jesus was made and not begotten. So here in the Creed of Nicaea that came out in 325, you have a paragraph that tells you that anybody from henceforth who dares to make a statement about Jesus in this manner will be cursed. Let's look at it. The, let's look at it. But the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes or curses those who say there was once when he was not. When you say there was once when he was not, you are saying there was one time in history when Jesus did not exist, when the second person did not exist. If anybody dares to hold this position, may he be cursed. Another statement, if anybody says he was not, he will be cursed. If anybody says before he was begotten, he will be cursed. If anybody says he was made out of nothing, he will be cursed because Jesus was not made. He was begotten. If anybody says those who assert that he is from some being or substance other than the father, he is to be cursed. If anybody says he is mutable, the word mutable means can change, can sin, liable to change. If anybody dares say that Jesus can change or liable to change and can sin, he is to be cursed. So in 325, Arius was condemned as a heretic and cursed. He was thrown out of the Roman Empire and therefore he was not part of the ecumenical church. He was part of his own heretical church. So he was not part of that one holy Catholic apostolic church. Okay. Um, I'm sh I, 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 I think maybe I'm going to stop and ask you whether you have any questions because I'm sure some of you are thinking uh, may you may have some co conflicting thoughts right now. So let me just ask you if you have any questions. Yeah, Dr. James, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the uh, the, the creeds, yeah. So yeah. I'm trying to think about the supporting scriptures to support uh, each of these uh, statements in the creed. Okay. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just thinking about three verses in the Bible. Okay. Right, um, okay, Genesis chapter 1. Um, right. uh, verse, uh, verse one to two talks about the uh, spirit of God, right? Mm -hmm. So the spirit of God is there, mm -hmm. um, and the the the, sh the prayer of Shema, Shema uh, Deuteronomy six nine yes. talks about the one God. Right. Um, Psalm two verse seven, which the writer of Hebrew did mention a few times about the uh, today you shall be my son. So these three, I kind of connect together that uh, uh, Jesus, the today is not today, today, but right. today appears since the beginning, today. Right, so, right. Um, so that is my three verses to support my understanding of what we learned today. So help me to correct my understanding if I'm along the right track. Yes, Thank definitely. You. You're, you're correct when you take a Genesis. Even from the very beginning, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in uh, verse 26, he says, let us make men in our own image. Let us make men in our own men image. And then you, you quoted the verse about the spirit hovering over the earth, right? Um, so there's the mention of the spirit. There's the mention of God. And then uh, the reference that God makes to him as more than one person. It's the maj majesty of the plurality of the majestic uh, expression of the let us make men in our own image. Um, and then the Psalm, uh, Psalm 2 that you mentioned as well. 
Um, so right through scriptures, we do have reference to uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the prophets. And then the prophets did miraculous things. And then you have the, um, the appearance of the second person in human form, the theophany, uh, that the appearance of God in human form. So you already there, you have references to uh, the three distinct persons who come at different times. Yes. Uh, so you were making a statement there, right? That we have biblical references to um, substantiate the creedal statement, be it Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Yeah, yes. And the Shema, and the Shema prayer. And the Shema, from... that's right, that's right. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yes, it's a reference to God as one substance, one nature, but it's not three or polytheistic. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. So so I have some question like, you know, how could they confuse with things like Hebrews chapter one talk about Jesus mm. having the exact character, the Greek word right. is character, exact, which exact exactly, representation. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And Philippians chapter two talk about uh, Jesus is mm. e equal to the Father. So is it because they didn't get interpreted correctly at the time? Uh, but now we have, on hindsight, we have all this uh, translation, uh, understanding of the Greek, what it meant. Um, so to give them a benefit of that, what happened at that time? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, at that time, I think the real issues were the need to protect God as one being, the need to protect. And, and because the issues that arose or the heresies that were surfacing at the time were about the second person and about the third person, uh, they now needed to make sure that people don't have the wrong impression that God is three, but one. And in order to preserve this fact that God is one, they would come up with options or possibilities that would lead them to be accused as heretics. That's the problem. The issue was not about God the Father. The issue was often in the New Testament, in the first, even in the New Testament, and in the first 500 years, it was often about Jesus Christ, where people just couldn't fully understand how to bring the two together and make them equal and at the same time keep them one. That was the, the real problem. And then if you notice, I mentioned in the, the Creed of Nicaea, the statement, I believe in the Holy Spirit, full stop, nothing, nothing else, right? But when you get into the Nicene Creed, you will notice there was an additional statement. Why? Because Macedonians came up with the option that G uh, the Holy Spirit is just a creature, not the same as God the Father. And so they needed to deal with that issue. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? I'm um, sorry. Is there a problem with the word begotten? Is there a problem? With the word begotten. I mean, this is a lightly translated word from the original um, right. language in the creed. So I also he heard um, the Muslims using this word begotten to um, refute the, the deity of Christ. So I'm not sure whether this word is problematic in English and, and because of that, there is a limitation in the understanding and therefore okay, the, you the would then need subsequent sentences okay. to clarify, okay. I'm not sure. Okay, I, let me just say, for the Muslims, they will hang on that word begotten to think of giving birth to. So they are in their mind, they will interpret the Trinity as the father having a relationship with Mary and Jesus comes into the picture. He was birthed. Begotten is birth, but begotten in the Hebrew word 
is not giving birth. It is bringing forth, coming out of. There is no sexual intercourse involved in that uh, coming forth. But in the mind of the Muslims, they will think of a sexual intercourse or relationship which brings forth Jesus. That's why they feel, how can you talk about Jesus as the son of God? They are thinking of it in a biological way, but it's not biological. I don't so know is that a problem that. with the translation? I mean, is that it's not, it's not a problem with the translation. It's a problem uh, or it's an issue that the Muslims will pick on to fight the Christians. It's not a problem with the uh, translation at all. Do you because think there's a better word? word? Is, sorry? Do you think there's a better word? I, I don't know if there is a better word from uh, with the Greek word ganea to bring forth. I really can't find a better word. Because short of saying birthed, which is wrong, you cannot use giving birth to. But bringing forth is not birth. I don't know if you think of bringing forth as birth. Because the word ganea is to bring forth. And we are saying that the father uh, brought forth the son into the world. And he was born as in the, uh, as he was, he, uh, Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit uh, and birthed into this world in, in human flesh. <clears throat> so I would not see uh, begotten as a, a, a problematic word, but it is quite an old fashioned word. Um, I'm not sure what equivalent we would have today. Can anybody, do, would anybody be able to help there? I, I can, I go and check and see if begotten is, there's any other form. Yeah, sorry, Eileen. It's okay. It's just, um, yeah, I, I think sometimes the language is quite limited in expression. And yes, so we and, get into all English kinds of language issues. language is exactly, the English language is definitely limited because we're trying to understand a Greek terminology and putting it in the English language. That is why later on next week, when we look at the Council of Chalcedon, and the person of Jesus Christ, and we look at the two natures of Christ, we will see how the council, um, the, the leaders had to come with two, two kinds of words, a Latin equivalent and a Greek e e equivalent, in order to explain the term of how Jesus, the one person, can have two natures in his one body. So that's another another very <laughs> complicated <laughs> issue that arose. And you know what? The reason why these things are so intense here in these 500 years is because Christianity came out of a Greek Roman environment. And so the language was Roman, a uh, Greek. And many of the leaders who were trained in, in the Christian faith had been influenced by Greek philosophy. So when they are trying to unravel a terminology in the Christian faith, they are actually using their Greek mindset to understand a Jewish Hebrew concept. So that's the problem. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody Professor else? James, that? I have a question. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, I found that... Uh... Arianism seems to be a derivative of uh, dynamic uh, monarchianism. It seems like. And, yeah, and that uh, probably it has been treated like uh, another heresy because of its popularity and because of the, the, the influence that it has uh, created by Arian. Could that be the case also? Um... I think Arian uh, monarchianism eventually kind of died down, but Arius was very, um, what shall I say, gung ho about fighting tooth and nail about the fact that Jesus was of a different substance 
um, in order to secure the oneness of God, the unity of God. So, and then, and then of course, when Athanasius fought him tooth and nail, Athanasius was saying, if Jesus were just uh, the first to be created by God, meaning he's still special, he's not special enough to atone for our sins. So Athanasius was feeling our salvation is still at stake if we have just a man to die on the cross for others. He could not have secured our salvation. So that is why it became such a, a big heresy that was, that needed to be resolved very quickly. Does that make sense? Yeah, but what I felt is that uh, Arianism is not much different from dynamic monarchianism. Uh, just a little bit variation, that's all. Well, I think it is quite different in that the dynamic monarchianism says that Jesus was just an ordinary man. It doesn't say he was the first to be created. Arius says that Jesus was the first crea creation, meaning he's extra special than anything and everything. So if God the Father created Jesus, and then Jesus created the world, but uh, adoptionists or uh, the dynamic monarchians would say that Jesus was just a good man, but at his baptism, the Spirit of God came upon him and he was adopted. So it's uh, quite a big difference. Lah. Yeah. Okay. All right, if you have no questions, I go back to... Uh, Dr. Uh, yes, yes. Can okay. I ask you, because regarding about this, uh, the word begotten, uh, I can uh. understand Jesus is uh, eternal. Yeah, but then when you see it's been brought forth uh, uh, by God, uh, it seems to be sort of, uh, there's one, at one point in stage, seems to imply at one stage that the uh, God the Father is alone, and then he bring out forth, and then only <laughs> then, you know. So it sounds a bit not exactly like creation, but it's something. Okay, maybe the it's time. that. Yeah, okay, maybe it's the way I said it. <laughs> I hope I don't become a heretic. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think what we need to note is the Jesus, when we know him as Jesus, because the angel said he's, he's to be called Jesus, for he shall save the, his people from their sins. He came as savior at that point, right? He was never known as Jesus before that. In, in eternity and in the New Old Testament, he is never called Jesus, never. Jesus is a New Testament name. In the, in the Old Testament, when God created the heavens and the earth, he was present. The second person was very present in creation. But he was only known as <clears throat> the eternal Logos in the intertestamental period and in John chapter 1. That is the, the beginning of the New Testament. Uh, during intertestamental period, <clears throat> the term Logos was used uh, to, to indicate how God revealed himself through his word to mankind. So uh, Jesus was never used. So when we say uh, the father begot the son, brought the son into, uh, into this world, it is an indication not that he wasn't in existence. He was, but he was divine with the father. Now he's coming into this world as a human being, through the Virgin Mary. Yeah. But he doesn't, uh, as somebody quoted Philippians chapter 2 just now, he laid aside his deity, doesn't mean that he was no longer God, but he didn't grasp, that says he didn't grasp equality with God, but he laid it aside and became a servant and became man and went to the cross. So it, in that particular passage of scripture is showing how the second person in the Trinity never grasped on to what he was when he came to this earth as men. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he addressed his father uh, and he pleaded with his father to remove, uh, if, he, if he could remove this 
thing from him where he didn't have di- removed a cup where he didn't have to go and suffer, but nevertheless, not my will. So when he comes into this world, earth, he is submissive to his father, God, as a son. But that does not mean that he was no longer God. He still had his God nature, which next week we are going to have another big debate about the two natures of Christ. That's going to be very complex. Yeah. So we hold on to that. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, Dr. James. Yes. Uh, may I speak? Uh, just now we, we talk about the dynamic monotheism uh, yes. to explain the Trinity. However, mm. I look at the notes, uh, only they explain about the uh, natures of uh, uh, Jesus Christ as his uh, son, but nothing mentioned about the Holy Spirit. How, how, it, how, it, okay. how, how, how does this monochemism, dynamic monochemism, there's no explanation about the Holy Spirit when okay. you're trying to explain okay. the Trinity? Good question. I think at that point, they're not explaining the Trinity in the creed of Nicaea, because the real problem was about the second person. You see, uh, theology is theology never happens in a vacuum. In other words, leaders in a church don't come together and say, hey, let's have a retreat. Let's talk about uh, the Trinity. Let's talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's not how theology is birthed. Theology is always birthed in a context. What's the context? The context is when there is a problem. Here, there's a big problem because of Arius. And the big problem that Arius has created is about the second person, not about the third person. Therefore, the third person, they still keep the statement, I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's it. But you now look at the next page of your notes and look at the Nicene Creed which took place in 381. There is a lapse between 325 and 381. Now, just very quickly, uh, if you are asking that question and there's no more question, can we just look at the creed, uh, the Nicene Creed now to answer your question? Is that all right? Okay. Okay, I, and if it's still not clear, then you ask me again, okay? Thank you. All right, let me see. Uh... How to share screen now. Okay. Let me share screen. Okay. Oh, I didn't put it here. <clears throat> oh, I didn't put it here. Okay. I will stop sharing. Let's just read. Uh, look at number 6B, the Nicene Creed. The first line is the same as the Creed of Nicaea. The second part of the, the second person in the Holy Trinity uh, is about the same. Except that you do not have true God, true, go, true God of true God and all that. That was because they were fighting areas. This time, they are making a statement to help us summarize in our understanding of who Jesus is. Now, now look at the next one, which is many, many lines down. I, I should have put it in a new sentence. And in the Holy Spirit. Can you see that? Do you see that? All of you can see that. Okay. Now notice under the Holy Spirit, it is quite long. You have a paragraph. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Who is this Holy Spirit? The Lord and life giver that proceedeth from the Father, who with the Son is worshipped together and glorified together, who spoke through the prophets. So here, the qualifier as to who the Holy Spirit is, is for them to note, listen, the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit who spoke to us in the Old Testament through the prophets. He's the same. He hasn't changed. He was not created. He didn't come suddenly into this world. He always existed as then, so now. And then they give you some more qualifiers. He's Lord, life giver, 
He comes from, now this here, instead of begotten, it talks about proceedeth. The same idea coming out of or coming forth from, from the Father, who with the Son is worshipped together and glorified together. You do not worship something that is not God. You do not glorify someone who is not God. But here the Holy Spirit is worshipped. The Holy Spirit is glorified. So to answer your question, in 381, there was another council, a second ecumenical council. At this council, it was imperative that the people understood that the Holy Spirit is truly God. Why? Because between Council of Nicaea and Council of Constantinople, there was Macedonius, this heretic who said that G uh, the Holy Spirit was a creature created by God. So they had to add the statement. So what now is being recited in the mainline churches like the Anglican, Methodist, Lutherans, and Presbyterians is this creed called the Nicene Creed did not come out of Nicaea, but was fully developed in 381 at the Council of Constantinople. So it's sometimes called the Nicene stroke Constantinople Creed, but it is, we call it Nicene Creed today because that's the creed that is recited. So here there are no anathemas, nothing, but in 325, there was some one paragraph where they cursed everybody who dared say that Jesus was a creature. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Anna? Okay. All right, good. Okay, uh, maybe we can just try and finish up here, uh, and then you can ask me a few questions, and then maybe the discussion or we can have without the reports, lah, because I think I'm, I, I'm looking at the time, and I realize that we are kind of <laughs> moving too quickly. Uh, but you've been such a great uh, class and uh, all that you've been asking and commenting. So let's let's just try and move on. Okay, so the next uh, point I have here in point seven is um, why, do you, why do you and I believe in the Trinity? And I, I put here in the notes, all Bible believing Christians believe in the Trinity. We all believe in the Trinity. We are not Unitarians. We are Trinitarians. Unitarian means there is only one God and one person. Trinitarian is one God in three persons. The three persons are yet one God. Yeah? Okay, so we have evidence from the Old Testament. And some of you have already mentioned it from Genesis, from uh, the Shema, from uh, Psalms, from the Philip, from Philippians, from the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one, the Old Testament shows us that the one true God revealed Himself um, <clears throat> to Abraham, and I mentioned the story before in in Genesis eighteen, uh, verse two, verse sixteen. There was a third person who was not an ordinary angel; he was a spiritual being. But unlike the other two, this person was definitely the second person in the Trinity. Every time when there was a, uh, a representation or a, a God in human form, it was not God the Father, it was always God the Son. And then finally, in the New Testament, God the Word became flesh. He came to show us exactly who God is in human flesh, lived with us for 33 years, died, rose again, spoke to the disciples and the church and ascended, promising he will return again. So that is the second person we see. God seems to be more than one person all the time. Let us make men in our own image. And then in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So you see all of that represented. So in the later in the discussion, I've given you Ephesians chapter 1 for you to take a look at some of the verses to see how the three persons are um, activated, doing different things for different purposes. 
for your salvation and mine. Okay, then evidence in the New Testament. We have the disciples who recognize Jesus as God, uh, the same God as their forefathers worshipped uh, during the time of Moses. Um, we have the same God, yeah, their forefathers worshipped during the time of Moses. We have evidence, uh, further evidences where Jesus told them that he would send the comforter who will abide forever, uh, where the Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost uh, on the believers, the 120 people who were assembled in the prayer room praying. Um, the Holy Spirit was reckoned and recognized as God himself. Okay, so the disciples and the early Christians acknowledged God the Father as one, God the Son as one, and God the Holy Spirit as one. One God, three distinct persons in the one Godhead, a mystery indeed. So throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, we have this teaching, and it was mentioned just now, Deuteronomy 6.4, uh, Mark 12, 28, 29. Uh, and yet, while there are three distinct persons, uh, I'm sorry, wh where, while God is one, there are distinct persons, three. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, which is the passage I want you to be looking at later on. And then at the baptism, you have the dove. We have the voice of the father telling the, the, the congregation that was around the baptismal uh, river, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So essentially, uh, we see the substantial unity. Substantial unity of the Godhead mean, means the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share one substance, one nature, one essence that makes them God. Then we saw the Great Commission. We saw the baptismal formula of the three persons in one. We talked about the benediction already. But uh, this is the picture I didn't give you in your thing. You might want to just take a picture of it, okay? Because um, I thought about this picture after I had sent out the notes. And I thought, oh, this is so important. Um, you know, we, we say... The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are um, three persons playing distinctive roles. Yes, but what I want you to see in this triangle is something very interesting. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father, or the Holy Father is not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. But they are three that share the same Godness. Father is God. Son is God. Holy Spirit is God. I think this is the most um, helpful picture that I have found. In not being a heretic like the modalistic monarchians, but while recognizing each play distinctive roles, yet in the Godhead, they do several things together. You know, when Jesus prayed that beautiful prayer in John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer, Jesus is talking to his father. And he's committing his disciples into the Father's hands. And he's praying that the Holy Spirit will protect the disciples from danger, from evil, from sin. And he says, sanctify them. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. But as Eileen was earlier on saying, sometimes we can be so distinctive in the, in the different roles that we can be heretical. So let's not be so distinctive. Let's say in conclusion, God is one, but 
God is seen in three distinctive persons who are specially involved in certain roles of creation, of, of, of um, the church, building the church, of leading the church, guiding the church, discipling the church. And uh, Jesus is our savior and our redeemer. Okay, so this picture, I hope, will help us. But I put down here, the Trinity is both mind-boggling and mysterious. Having tried to explain it in this triangle and saying it in these words, he is God and yet the Father is not the Son, I think we need to end this whole discussion by saying it is still a mystery. I cannot fully fathom this mystery, but one day my Father God is going to help me understand this mystery as I meet God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know, we sing the song which comes from the book of Revelation, the lion and the lamb. Jesus is both the lion of Judah and he's also the lamb that was that was slaughtered and his blood was spilled over for our transactions and for our salvation. Okay, so um, let me... Okay, I have given you some questions um, that I hope, actually this you can do uh, in very uh, personally. Um, let me see. Huh? I can't, I can't read the whole thing. Let me just, okay. Uh, look at the two creeds, the creed of Nicaea and the creed and the Nicene creed. In what ways was the creed of Nicaea sufficient to deal with the Arian problem or heresy? Can you think of a modern heresy? So what I want you to do really here after reading is, is there a modern cult you can find that fits the description of Arianism? And then the second one is uh, maybe a more personal thing. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. And I want you to write a prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for what Paul is expressing as the gifts that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have given to us. Okay, so what I will do, it's now... Um, 12.20, right? Is it 12.20 for you? Uh, I, I'm going to ask Evangeline to break us into, uh, break all of you into random groups of seven or eight. And then you discuss the first one with uh, the, that question of a modern heresy. And then read together in your small group, Ephesians 1, 13 to, uh, 1, 3 to 14 that whole section. And in, in Greek, you know, when it was first written, Paul never had any full stop. It was a one long, long sentence. It's like a doxology, giving thanks to the Father for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So look at that. It's such a beautiful thing. And then uh, come back in about uh, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, Ivan, can you break them up in, and give them 20 minutes so that after 20 minutes, they will come back to the main hall? Okay. Okay, great. Everybody's here. Some have left already because of uh, they're on the road. But... Um, <clears throat> Maybe, um, I'm not sure how we will discuss this, but does anybody uh, have anything to share with regard to what you all were discussing in your group? Any insights like uh, between the two creeds? Any modern heresy that you notice? 
uh, comes out of Arianism. <clears throat> Anybody? I, I'm not sure how this is going to be operating because I uh, you, you were just in different rooms and I don't know whether you knew what rooms you were in. But maybe I just leave it open to, we don't have much time, but um, several of you can share um, <clears throat> what you have learned from a lesson you have learned from today and from the creeds. Maybe I share, uh, Dr. Sure. James. Sure. Yeah. Now, I was thinking we, uh, in, my, in our discussion, I, I think that um, no creed is perfect. Okay. The, Bi the Bible is, good, is the perfect word of God. And uh, to, to fully understand the, um, the, the deity of Jesus, right? Um, I think one need to really know the Bible. Okay. Um, and there are so many translations today, you know, and for, to help us to understand God. Because I look mm -hmm. at the creed, uh, no matter how, it's still man written. And then mm -hmm. the, uh, we also have interpretation problem. Depend on how you look at it. It's a, it's a half full glass or a full uh, half empty full, right? That kind of interpretation. So um, it's really like soak yourself into the word of God for, before we actually can actually uh, uh, to to read. I mean, there's about what the Bible says in Ephesians four, right? Uh, right? We need a lot of uh, a lot of people in our lives to help us to reach full unity of the knowledge of Christ. Right. Um, so, so I thought that that is really important for uh, not to rely on creed and then live, mm -hmm. life goes on, you know, but really soak ourselves into the word of God and live according to what Jesus uh, wants us to live, like what okay. he wants us to do. So in terms of modern heresy, uh, I, I cannot think of uh, the, the clear cut one, like uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons. Uh, yeah, so I can't think of, because the rest... Of denomination, they have different emphasis, right? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't call them heretics, but really like different emphasis and, and okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Yes, I can. Can I share? Can I share a little bit? Sure. Sister, <laughs> hello. Yes, Arianism, it's a very dangerous teaching okay. which attacks, which attacks the deity of Jesus Christ, our mm -hmm. Savior and our Lord. Very dangerous. Modern cults also attacked, like brother said, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, New Age, mm. all other Islamic groups, they, they attack the deity of Jesus Christ. They say he wasn't crucified, he was yeah. separated, he is mm -hmm. not the Lord. He is something else. He was yeah. just a carpenter or some. He's not just a carpenter. He's, a, he's our savior and our Lord. Amen and amen, sister. Amen. amen. Agreed. Yes. And I think uh, it's absolutely right that we need to saturate ourselves with the Bible, with the word of God. You know, in the first 500 years, they didn't really have the Bible. People couldn't read or write. And the only way they could remember right from wrong was to memorize the creeds. So the creeds played a very vital role at a time where people did not have the word of God in their hands and they couldn't read. The only option is to hide God's word in our minds and in our hearts that we will not sin against God. And so we, we want to thank God for the leaders who fought battles in order to preserve the truth. And they've come out with solid statements as to who Jesus is, who God the Father is, who the Holy Spirit is. So that if today somebody were to ask us, for example, uh, tell, me, uh, tell me something about Jesus Christ. The, if you have memorized the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, immediately the statement will be there in your head because you've already hidden it in your heart. And, and so you will be able to say it. But a lot of us don't study the Word of God properly. Sometimes we don't even study the Word of God. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary and imperative that we read God's Word Study God's word, 
and memorize God's word, Bible verses, so that we can affirm in our own hearts when uh, we meet with some opposing views about Jesus or the Holy Spirit or God the Father or something else, salvation. So learn the word of God, study it, hide these truths in your heart, memorize scripture. And I think today, because we are so used to being able to, like on our fingertips, get through Google and get verses and everything, we don't memorize so much. I mean, I grew up <laughs> memorizing verses in Sunday school. And when I was in Bible college, we had to memorize chunks and chunks of scripture uh, because we didn't have all those things that you have now today. Uh, but what if these gadgets don't work? The best thing is to have it here in you. So study God's word when you can and when you have the means and let God's word really uh, take root and grow deeper and deeper in you. Okay, so much for uh, <clears throat> that. Yes, it's true that uh, what that brother said just now uh, from um, Abba ja uh, Abba Azerbaijan. 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 Uh, that uh, Jesus Christ, Arianism is a terrible and, and crafty uh, deception. Jesus Christ is under attack. Many, many heresies attack Jesus, including Islam. And we want to know the truth and so that we can be set free by the truth and lead others into the truth so that they too can be set free. So know the Lord. Uh, the Lord well, know him, not just know things about him, know him personally, make him your Lord and not just savior so that he rules your life and guides you. Any other comments? Sister Violet, I'm sorry. I, 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 I wrote the uh, very small message to you. You probably already saw that. No, I haven't. Uh, no. No, did I, you write me a message? I shared, yes, I shared my contacts with you. No, you didn't? Oh, no, I didn't. I, I must, when we went out of the Zoom, I guess it must have been there. Ah, okay. You will see them after that. If, okay. if, in case, if, if, in case, if you don't see them, uh, so I can write the letter to, uh, to, ah, the, to Evangeline. Uh, I think she would have got the message. No, I, I would get it from her. No, I don't have uh, Dr. Violet James. Can you please on the chat icon? I think he he sent it to Elson. Do you actually? I don't, I don't. I don't have that in my chat icon. I only have. Uh... No, the chat is closed. That's why I cannot write it here. Can Can you uh, disclose? Oh, so, uh, so who do you? Uh, how do you actually send a message to Dr. Violet? Uh, by by this pro but yes yeah, by this program by I use the chat he said but uh, yeah. can you um can yeah. you write to evangeline and give her your whatever you wanted to say to me so that she can pass it on to me yes uh, how, how can i write to her to just to this okay, why don't i give you my address my email please please okay Let done Okay, Let you got me... it. James at sbc.edu.sg. It's in the chat. Can you see the chat? Admin, I can see it. No. Oh, you can't wait, see wait. it. Wait. Wait, let but me if check. You go to the chat and then you might click the chat. You will see them. It should have come up too. Do, do the rest of you see my message? Okay, then uh, something must be wrong with our brothers maybe yes let me let me double check here please very quickly okay okay where should i see it uh, in the chat. the chat right click it's to everyone so you should uh, yeah, it's this bv right bv james at sbc.edu.sg. Yeah, got it? Yes, okay, great. 
That's your that's your email. Okay. That's my email. Yeah. Okay. Anybody CBS. else has anything to say? Uh, Dr. James. Yes. Mm. Just a just a talk. I want running. Correct me if I'm wrong. You mentioned God, the person, Jesus, the person, is it Holy Spirit, the person, the word person. Uh huh. The word person, person. Okay. Mm. God, the person, the Trinity, Trinity. God so is a person. A God, person. the Father is a person. Yes. God, the Son mm. is the same. Yes, there are the three person. persons. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this word three. person. I'm just wondering, would you be expounding further on this word? The word itself, person. Because um, it was uh in my thoughts, the word person in the human mind. Okay. Person is you know are we okay when we think of a person? Yes. We think of the person with a personality, the ability to communicate, ability to feel, to think, to have emotions, um, uh, and mental capacity to think, and a will, a volition to act. So it's in that in that uh, capacity that we look at the Father, we look at the Son, and we look at the Holy Spirit. They have yeah, characteristics. The characteristics. Yes, that's I, right. I, 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 the thought came to me that God is more than just the person. Oh, the yes, person, oh, yes, yes, definitely. God is highly, highly, much more in the spiritual. Yeah, 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 De definitely. So that's why we are saying uh, Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. That's the starting point. All of them share the same God nature. That's the starting point. God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we come to know who God is through uh, the person of Jesus Christ. Then we have uh, experienced the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as he has changed us from being maybe a drug addict to becoming one who is totally freed and no longer a slave to the sins of this world. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. But when we uh, are talking about the Trinity, we are not only looking at them as spirit, but we are looking at them with a personality. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was telling myself that uh, it, it's not a context of just a human person. It's oh, yes, yes, yes. No. Itself, I mean, to me, there's a high spiritual rhyme that I can never fully appreciate, but that's sure. the power of the tree. Is beyond in the human yes. being. Yes, yes. So don't don't get uh, derailed by the word person as making him small, smaller than what he should be. Don't derail that. The use of the word person is to describe his ability to communicate and to um, have all of the capacities that you and I understand uh, in a person. But he's definitely more than a human being. He's not human in that sense. Only Jesus took on humanity. Yeah? Of course. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. You know, I gave you uh, the last question, a prayer. I know we won't share it here. But can you use that in uh, as, as a homework to do? Just for your own personal well-being, write a prayer to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in uh, with that um, sense of gratitude that you feel for all that the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has done for you as a believer in Christ. Can you do that? I think that will be a good exercise for you. And then um, I know that time is running. And I'm not going to hold you, but I want to close with a prayer taken from Ephesians, but not the portion you read. I want to read verses 15 to 23 as I close the section. And as I read, I would like you to also see how the three persons in the Trinity are at work in your life and mine as we continue to follow the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord. So let me read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Verse 15. 
For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, this is Paul writing, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who rules in all. And may this same God, our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, empower each one of us in this coming weekend to go forth to serve him with joy, gladness, and a thankful heart. The Lord be with you. I see you next week, face to face. Okay, God bless you. Take God care. Bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.